Hi, welcome to the Signal Path. In this episode, I have an exciting analysis for you guys. I have the Starlink satellite dish behind me, which we're going to take a look at in detail. It was sent to me by one of the viewers who's already done the initial teardown and analysis of his own. I have linked his video in the description, so thanks for that. I think this is going to be a really interesting analysis here. Now, most of the stuff that I'm going to talk about here is going to be fairly advanced, and it's going to assume some background information about how phased arrays work, but hopefully it will give you some pointers on where to look for further information, and we're going to do x-ray on it. I'm talking about the RFICs and the architecture of the entire stack from a manufacturing point of view, as well as from, of course, an RF performance point of view. Now, a lot of this may seem like exotic technology, but the reality is that phased arrays are probably in use more than they have ever been in the history of communication. This is mostly because of the introduction of millimeter wave 5G, but satellite phased array communication has been around for a long time. These things were invented over a hundred years ago, at least the concept and the physics behind it has been discovered for a long time. But let's jump right into it. There's a lot to talk about. So let's take a look at this Starlink dish one layer at a time. And therefore, we can analyze how every layer is considered from an engineering point of view, mechanical, RF, thermal, and so on. So I don't have the full dish, of course, that's covered in the other video. And the full dish has a mechanical steering on top of the beam forming. And this is because it's very difficult to cover the entire sky from a single beam former and not have horrible grading lobes or side lobes. And in fact, combining a mechanical steering with a single panel uh, RF beam forming or some kind of a beam forming structure allows you to have a much better performance. The mechanical steering is very slow, the RF beam forming is very fast, so that's a compromise to cover the entire uh, sky by using a single panel. Otherwise, you're going to have to have multiple panels. So the very top surface of this is white, and that's not surprising because this is going to be exposed to the sun quite a bit. It is pointing towards the sky, and as a result, you want it to have good thermal behavior. That's probably why it is this color. Now, on top of this, the design of a beam forming like this, a, an antenna on a dish that points to the sky that's flat, is somewhat more difficult than, let's say, a 5G base station, because the 5G base station will be mostly, most of the time, at least vertically mounted. So you don't have rain directly falling on top of this. So the surface of this probably would have to be hydrophobic so that the water doesn't accumulate on top of it. And if snow accumulates on it, then it would be over. And some of the thermal behavior of this would allow the snow to melt, at least in a thin layer underneath the, the snow that would otherwise form and the hydrophobic nature would make it wash off this. And they can do some clever things by moving the array uh, mechanically and then you know, getting the water off of it if they detect that there is some kind of an accumulation, which is kind of cool. Now, the radon material itself, aside from having ultraviolet protection, all the stuff that I described, also interacts with the RF waveform directly because it's sitting in front of it. So an ideal radon material is one that is basically invisible to the RF signal. Now, that's impossible because, first of all, most materials that would be somewhat invisible to the RF are very expensive and they're not as flexible. For example, Teflon is a good material. It has very l it's very low loss. Again, it's quite expensive, and it may not have some of the properties they're looking for. This looks like that it is uh, FR4 based with some kind of epoxy and laminate on top of it, which is you know, a good, cheap thing to manufacture and probably doesn't have much effect on the RF because it's so exceptionally thin. Now, this is not where it ends from an RF point of view. So if you look over here, you can see that there is a tiny gap between where the antennas begin, and we'll talk about the antennas in detail, and the actual surface of the, this, uh, this radome. That gap is there uh, is on purpose, and the, the distance between them is well controlled. So let's think about why you would need that gap at all, and what would happen if you don't have it. Well, what is the easiest thing to do? Well, the easiest thing to do is to attach the radome directly on the antennas. But that has several consequences. First of all, the dielectric material properties of this radome, uh, its lateral potential wave propagation, as well as its loss, will then be directly coupled to your antenna. And that changes the antenna's impedance towards the air, which means that the size of the antenna and everything else will be different depending on the dielectric material that is on top of this, not to mention its loss. So you then naturally would say, okay, well, I want to have the radome as far away from the antenna as possible. That's a good thing, but of course it makes the antenna thicker, it makes the whole structure much harder to build. And at the same time, what happens is when the beam is pointing forward, the distance between the radome and the direction of the beam is constant across the array. If you start increasing the distance as the beam is steering around, then you have some other effects that would be that the radome would look different to the individual arrays and to the collection of the arrays as the beam is steered. So you have additional complexities because of that. This is probably why they've chosen the distance they have, and they've obviously done full EM simulation between the antenna and the patch and everything and the radome to make sure it has good performance. So overall, you know, there's a lot of things to consider about radome design. 
at very, very high frequencies where you cannot get a lot of power from individual devices, you know, in the terahertz region or in the hundreds of gigahertz, people use traditional lenses. And your radome can also be a lens at the same time. This is quite common in, in terahertz images and illuminators, but you would use a silicon lens on top of it that would then point and focus the beam to get much, much, much more gain out of your array, for example. That complicates the beam forming, but that's a whole other story. So that's the radome. Let's go one layer down. Now, flipping this around, you can see the spacer, the honeycomb pattern spacer that is used to separate the first antennas at the top and the radon material itself. This is most likely injection molded. And the, the cost of manufacturing these and the repeatability of it is, is obviously really important. So they have to take that into account. So in order to see this a little bit better, I'm going to zoom in so we can talk about the patches as well. But you can see that this is essentially one piece. And it's not that large. And you know, injection molding these things can be done at very uh, large surfaces. And then the surrounding material all glued and epoxy to the whole thing to give it both a good seal in terms of not having any water seep into it, as well as a good structural integrity in these clips at the end connect to the back mechanical pieces, which I don't have anymore. So let's zoom into this area and take a closer look. OK, so here's a closer look here. Now you can see the back of the radon material, which does look like an FR4 type material fairly well. The spacer, the honeycomb pattern, this black piece here is glued onto it. The perimeter also is uh, copper with some interesting patterns on it. The GPS antennas are also on the perimeter. We'll talk about that pattern in a little bit. And the spacer that's on top of these patches is also this white material. It may not be as visible, but the thickness of this top spacer and the bottom spacer are not the same. So these circular patches that you see are essentially floating from an RF point of view as much as possible between the radon material and the second patch that's on the main PCB. Now, if I look at these patches themselves, they are obviously circular. They're most likely circularly polarized as well could be dual polarized, circularly polarized. We'll take a look at the left hand and right handed. And uh, you can see that there are some slits cut into them. So these slits are much, much smaller than the wavelength of operation, obviously, because you can see from the dimension of the slits with respect to the spacing of the antennas and everything else. But these slits are quite important because they can suppress various modes that you don't want inside the antenna. And this can be helpful when you want to have an antenna that has a certain bandwidth or a large fractional bandwidth without invoking additional modes in unwanted frequencies. The depth of these slits, the width of them, are quite important. And these can all be electromagnetically stimulated with the appropriate tools, taking into account all of the other things that are around it. Now, the antenna-to-antenna -antenna coupling is really important in any phase array, as it affects the way the antenna impedance changes as you steer the beam. Because the incident phase that hits each of these antennas will be different. And therefore, depending on the relative phase between the antennas, which is how beam forming is accomplished, the impedance by the antennas changes if they're not well insulated from each other. So the distance between these antennas, we'll talk about that a little bit later as well, and the material in between them and how they're organized with respect to each other, even the angle in which these slits face each other, all can contribute to how well these are insulated. And there's some clever techniques used, I believe, in the main PCB, which we will talk, at, talk about as well. Now, I don't know if it's visible on the camera or not, but there are tiny little dots. Each of these circular polarized antennas has a tiny dot right there in the slit. And that dot is essentially a hole. It's drilled in there. It's very, very small. And that is most likely to equalize the pressure between the cavity formed above and below the antenna as this thing goes through various thermal cycles and it makes sure that there is no bulging and there is no popping between these uh, antennas and the, the radon material or the PCB. So it's really you know, well thought out as to be expected. There is not much else really to talk about here. I'll try and tear one of these antennas off so we can put it on top of the other one to so illustrate how this stack actually works. But other than that, it's a, you know, a really fairly nice, really uniform, big, big structure. Lots of elements. I think it's maybe 1,200, 1,300 elements or so in total. But yeah, quite nice. Let's go one layer down to the main PCB. And here's the antenna a little bit closer. Hopefully you can see the little hole that's drilled into it for the pressure, uh, presumably. And you can see the slits quite well. And the surface of the antenna here, you can see this is unfinished. This is basically the raw copper. So there's no surface finish like enig or epinig or anything like that. Traditionally, that's required because the copper will tarnish and that surface resistance can drastically increase and that increases the losses of the material. But I guess here they're counting on the fact that this is fully weatherized and hermetically sealed to a point where they don't believe to have any surface finish is needed. Copper itself is really good if you can get it smooth, so you don't necessarily need a surface finish unless you want to solder to it or finish it in some other way. And here is the main PCB. It's really quite beautiful considering how large it is. Lots and lots of elements all uh, surrounded with some other 
filler material in the middle. So we'll talk about that too. So these antennas themselves are silicure as well, and they will couple to the upper layer antennas with the appropriate spacer in between them. Now, coupled patches are very, very common. They're probably the most common way of building these kind of phased arrays, at least in the past couple of years. By adjusting the height between the patches and adjusting with the material between them and the distance and all that, you can create fairly wide bandwidth patches. And two is not the limit, you can even make more. It's just that the more patches you put, the more complex the manufacturing becomes. Now, between this patch at the bottom and the patch that we saw at the top, the distance between them is filled with air, essentially, which is the best you can do. I mean, a, an air-coupled patch will give you very good performance. And the distance between the antennas themselves is, of course, determined by the frequency, and there is some material in the middle as well, and we talked about how they couple to each other laterally as well as to vertically. Now, there are lots and lots of ways of adjusting the vertical coupling, how you feed the antenna, how they couple to each other, all of these techniques are essentially after the same thing. They want to increase the bandwidth, they want to reduce any resonances, they want to increase the gain of the antenna, and so on. Now, if you look at the entire structure, these are a uh, triangular lattice. Triangular lattices are not that common in telecommunication, but they're quite common in sat SATCOM, as this is, of course. And the advantage of having a circular patch in a triangular lattice is that every corner of every patch is equidistant to all the other surrounding patches. It's a really nice uniform structure. It has some disadvantages. Normally, rectangular arrays are made out of individual pieces, which you can assemble like a Lego, whereas this is all in one piece. Manufacturing something as this scale in one piece is quite a bit harder. But it has the advantage of having extraordinary good uniformity, especially in scenarios when you want to have this kind of circularly polarized left and right-handed structures. Now, the up and down frequencies that this uses for transmit and receiver, I think 10 gigahertz and 14 gigahertz. Now, they are not really high in frequency, but 10 to 14 gigahertz is a fairly high bandwidth that you require from these patches. It's still a, a large fractional bandwidth, and we'll talk some of the tricks that it has probably gone into that, including the vertically coupled patches for that. If you also look, the corners of these are missing, and if you, the reason for that is when you want to do tapering, which is used to adjust the power of the elements as you go radially out, that is to help reduce side lobes. And tapering is a very common technique to get rid of side lobes, and when you do that, the corner elements don't really do much anymore, especially when they're in the corner of a rectangular grid. So by chopping them off, you save having to implement those corner arrays. You reduce the number of elements. You get some inherent tapering built into the array itself. So, you know, you just chop them off. The amount of power you give up and the amount of aperture gain you give up as a result of cutting those corners becomes not so significant, especially for such a large array if you need to do tapering. So that's because of that reason. Now, in between the antennas, normally you don't see much, but in this case, you see a grid. It's hard to see from the angle you're looking at it. We'll zoom in. And the material in the middle is also copper on a particular grid. And these are electromagnetic band gap type of structures. They can be periodic, they can be non-periodic, and they affect several things at the same time. They actually can improve the gain of the antenna. So the entire efficiency, the direct directivity of this entire array can be improved with those structures. They can suppress unwanted modes and unwanted interactions between the elements by choosing the sizes and how they're distributed. In this case, also filling the entire thing with copper and having those cutouts in them can give it a nice uh, surface finish in a way that they, the whole thing wouldn't warp. So it may have other advantages as well. It gives you good therm thermal conductivity, which then can radiate out to the radium and melt any ice or whatever else that may be on top of it. Now, one thing I need to, to remind you is that Every time you change something with these EM structures, you never are turning one knob at a time. You change the distance between the patches, several things change at the same time. That's why the design of these is so much intuition initially before it gets into heavy simulation, because you have so many parameters to worry about, and there's so much interaction between everything. That's why RF design is kind of like black magic in some way, because of that. Now, if you look at the way this is also arranged, that this is a multi-stack, PCB. This is not actually one piece. At least I don't think so. We will find out when I break it apart and take some of the pieces off. And the reason is you need to feed these antennas. And how they're fed is also really important. They could be probe fed. They could be aperture coupled in some way. We'll find out once we take it apart a little bit more. But at least we now know that there's at least two patches coupled to each other with an air dielectric gap in the middle. So let's zoom in and take a look at these structures a little bit more. There's another couple of few comments I wanted to make before I forget, is that there are a lot of patents by Starlink on how some of these things are manufactured and put together, which you can go and look up and, and figure out, of course. Not every patent that they produce is going to be implemented in this particular product, but it's interesting to see their thought process. 
Another comment I wanted to make is these circular, uh, these circular patches with the cutout in them, there's a few ways of thinking about it. I mentioned that they suppress some kind of other modes that you don't want. Another way to think about it is that it changes the effective size of the antenna. If you make the antenna larger, it will resonate at lower frequencies, which you may not want. By getting these cutouts in them, you can, in a way, suppress the unwanted modes and change the effective physical size uh, of these antennas as well. So there's a lot of way, different ways to think about these. The other thing I wanted to mention is the distance between the patches, of course, affects the bandwidth and several other parameters. You can create dual resonances and so on to increase the bandwidth of these. Remember, this has to operate in two different frequencies. And uh, they, uh, you want to have the same aperture gain and same performance in the uplink and in the downlink, even though the bandwidth the effective RF bandwidth of the signal is not very high, but you need to operate at those two frequencies on the same aperture, and that can be challenging. And that some of those dual resonances or other techniques uh, can be very useful in that situation. And the distance between the antennas doesn't have to be super uniform here. We're not in the micron level in accuracy because the frequency is still fairly low. But you do want it to be as uniform as possible, otherwise the parts of the array can have a different frequency resonances and different gains and the other, and that will totally tilt the array or create a, a side lobes that you don't want. So it can be quite important. And I'm sure they have spent a lot of time in the manufacturing of this to ensure that they have a good repeatable process of, of gluing all these pieces together. And if you look in the four corners of this, we have fiduciary points. These are alignment points. And I think this is because this antenna part itself is a separate PCB, because you, you may not want to manufacture the antennas, the RFICs, the traces, all in the same stack, because the stack becomes very thick and quite expensive. So if you manufacture it on a separate PCB or separate layer, just like this was on a separate piece, and glue them all together with appropriate alignments, you can reduce the cost of the manufacturing quite a bit, which I think what's going on over here. And here is the zoomed in version of the array. Now you can clearly see the patches next to each other. Diameter of these two patches don't even really have to be the same. It's mostly another parameter you can play around with. In between the antennas, you can see the band gap structure. This is a uniform band gap structure with the cutouts around them. Really nice and, and unfinished copper as well. This, I said that this is a low frequency in a way, and I'll show you the consequences of what happens to go to a much higher frequency. So here's an array that's designed by us. Here we go. This is a 100 gigahertz array, and there are 25 antennas here. You can see these 25 antennas essentially fit on top of one of these circular patches, and that is the consequence of going up by a factor of 10 in frequency. Everything shrinks, of course, physically. There's an RFIC on the other side of this. And that's a fully integrated 24-element um, beamforming phased array with up and down converters and PLLs and so on. It's a quite a complex RFIC. These can be scaled into essentially any size, and that's what I was talking about by building something that's scalable that you can assemble like Lego pieces. And this particular one is publicly announced and released, that's why I'm sharing it here. But you can see what happens when you increase the frequency. For instance, these cutouts in these patches, you cannot implement them here because the PCB simply doesn't have the resolution to accommodate for what happens when you shrink this by this much in order to be able to produce these patches. These are also vertically coupled patches, but we cannot put air in between them because the dimensions are so small. And you can see how thin this is, but these are also vertically coupled patches. So these techniques really are applicable to any frequency, but as you go to very, very high frequencies, a whole other set of challenges come in, not to mention the challenges from the RFIC and silicon implementation of these uh, devices as well. So now that we have a good idea of how all of these work and how they scale, let's look at the other side. And here is the main PCB, and it is beautiful. Look at how many chips and how many ICs that are on there. It is a really large-scale engineering effort, uh, quite, quite nice to see. So let's talk about how this is built. Now, I can spend hours talking about various aspects of this and the different architectures beamformers can have, but let's get some of the main points at least across here. So this entire thing is designed with power over Ethernet and a single Ethernet interface. It's quite convenient for consumer applications to do this because you only have one cable, that's Ethernet, and that connects to some other modem somewhere else. That comes over here. The power is separated from the Ethernet traffic, and the Ethernet traffic, I believe, is handled by this chip over here. We'll talk about that in a second. This other connector goes into these two ICs, which then controls the motors externally to move this array mechanically. So all of that is enclosed in one, one single cable going into it. Very nice. On the perimeter are all the DC-DC converters. So the power over Ethernet comes in, gets distributed to all of these around here. Each of these different subsections probably feed a portion of this. They're all DC-DC converters with various voltages to feed these chips. 
If I look at these voltages, we're looking at 1.8 volt, 1.0 volts, and so on. And this tells me that these chips are al almost certainly silicon. Whether they are silicon germanium by CMOS or pure CMOS, it's not so clear. Now, the voltage is quite low, so it could be CMOS. The chips are all made by ST Microelectronics. ST has a lot of silicon processes, some of the best silicon uh, by CMOS, silicon germanium by CMOS processes in the world, and they also, of course, have, have CMOS processes. So it could be any of those. It could even be SOI. Anyway, we, we won't really know the process. We're just guessing by the voltages. In the corner over here, we have an ST chip. This is the main uh, modem and the heart of this, where all the traffic will come through here. This has the Ethernet interface. ST has quite a few SATCOM modems and SOCs that are available publicly for purchase. These are all custom chips with custom part numbers made for Starlink, obviously. And uh, what's exactly in here versus what's exactly in here, uh, it's not so clear. You have to do some more reverse engineering. But it is obvious that this thing with the memory next to it and everything runs some firmware, some low-level software to control all of this, is responsible for all the beam forming, perhaps multiple beams at the same time, and responsible for grabbing the data from this and forwarding it to the Ethernet, as well as all the Ethernet stack required to talk to an external box. GPS over here in the corner is probably the least interesting thing on this board, and the dc to converters, as I explained. In the middle over here, we have a PLO, a single PLO generator, a single LO source for the entire array. This is most likely used to synchronize everything as well. Now, before we go any further, we need to talk about what kind of architecture this actually has from a beamforming point of view. There are many, many ways to build phased arrays and many ways to move a beam electronically. The most common way is to do it in the analog domain, either at RF beamforming, where the RF frequency directly, the, the same signal that leaves the antenna, phase shifting is applied to the RF. You can apply phase shifting to the LO signal on all the mixers or on the IF after down conversion or before up conversion. All of those architectures have been extensively studied. Most of 5G millimeter wave radios that are on the market, they all use RF beamforming. Now with RF beamforming, you have the, well, a very simple architecture from an RFIC design point of view at least, but it has some disadvantages and so on. The ultimate way of building a phased array is to do pure digital beamforming. In that situation, every antenna has its own up and down converter and its own analog to digital converter and digital to analog converter. That is the most expensive architecture, but also the most flexible one. It allows you to create as many beams as you want. It allows you to do essentially the most complex, highest efficiency system at the cost of very, very complex hardware. That's probably one of the reasons why, you know, essentially every 5G system is not using that yet. But more and more of them are coming available. You can also create multiple beams using traditional RF beamforming, for instance, but you have to have parallel paths and other complexities come into play. So what architectures does this use? Well, it is also possible to do hybrid, where you have part of your system, let's say RF beamforming, part of it be digital beamforming, or every other combination. Now, there is some indication on this board that there may be some digital beamforming involved here because some of these power supplies are labeled as DBF, which is digital beamforming, and some of them are FEM, which is front-end module. So the power supplies for the different sections are treated differently. If you look at this, this obviously has a repeating pattern. It has some main ICs surrounded by a lot of little ICs. Each of these main ICs appears to be connected to eight adjacent chips. So let's take this one, for example. This is connected to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So at first glance, it may seem like that this could be an eight-channel beamformer. But actually, I think that these are 16-channel beamformers. That's because each of these front-end modules are actually dual-channel, not a single channel. Now, there is some other things we need to take into account. This array is supposed to transmit and receive, of course, but it's also supposed to transmit and receive at different frequencies, which means that these front-end modules would have to be tuned differently when they are transmitting than when they are receiving. This means that it, is, it may be wise to design the LNAs and the power amplifiers in the front-end module at two different paths and not have a front-end switch. This is clever. It's been done by other companies as well. Uh, I believe Samsung has something similar to this, but that's not in two different frequencies. But I think that's what's going on. Once we x-ray some of this, we can at least see the traces. So this would imply that each of these is 16 channels. Each channel is a full transmit-receive. It goes into this. And this front-end module then splits it into two transmit and two receive, which then connects to the circularly polarized antennas. How those go into the circularly polarized antennas, we need to still find out. But it could be that the two receive channels go into creating one circular polarized, and the two transmit channels 
the other circular polarized, one left-handed and one right-handed. There's some indication of that without looking at the chips because in the corners, when these front-end modules can't reach an antenna because there is no antenna, they terminate into surface mount resistors. And this is a few places around this uh, where that happens. And in there, those are labeled as RX1, TX1, RX2, and TX2. That kind of confirms my suspicion that that's how this architecture is. Now, I don't think this actually uses RF beamforming. I don't believe there are phase shifters inside this. This doesn't seem to have enough pins for you to communicate with it in a digital way and control all the beams at the same time, which means that the beamforming is probably done inside here. Now, the question is, is it done per element? I don't think so. It could be done per chip, which means that each of these chips could be a digital beam former on its own, meaning that it has one ADC and DAC, but individual elements are time delayed or are phase shifted. It could be. It's hard to know. You have to do a reverse engineering on the whole thing. But obviously, these all need to be synchronized together. So there is a main PLL in the center. That PLL goes and gets distributed to all of these chips. And there has to be some synchronization algorithm to align them all together and find out what the phases and what the delays between all of these are. There's a connector here, which could be used for calibration. For example, it may very well be that in factory they connect this to a signal. It could be on the transmit or on the receive, and they align all of these using the algorithms built into it in far field measurement, potentially, and store all of the calibration coefficients inside the modem, for example. That could be one way to do it. It's an expensive uh, factory testing one, but it is possible. So one thing is for sure, all of the data from all of these in multiple beams or in one beam, whatever it may be, is most likely sent to this in a digital interface. Now these ST chips, there are similar ST chips on the market where each individual chip has an analog to digital, digital to analog converter with phase delay elements per element where they can talk to each other with various SERDIs. This could be the same architecture here, where they are coordinated with a master SERDES interface, and the data is sent in and out of them using the similar kind of interfaces. This is fairly complicated, just because it is such a large array, but it is possible, at least in these frequencies, that the bandwidth here is not so high, so that the rate in which the SERDES need to run to send data in and out is not so high, and you can easily capture the entire throughput of this using a single chip over here. And it's pretty complicated. And the interface, of course, with the X-ray and the whole thing hopefully become more clear. The tape over here is a good thermal interface. And it could be that some of this tape is also an RF absorber, preventing these traces to radiating out in and out and creating resonances. That's one possibility. And this thermal material here connect to the aluminum piece at the back of this, which is not here anymore. That's how the whole heat gets out. So let's go ahead and put this into the X-ray machine and see what it looks like. I'm just looking around to see if I missed anything um, that I can think of. There are some patents on this, of course, where they show some of the architectures. Again, this is my guess based on what I'm looking at and based on some of the C things that I see on the board and how they're connected. But I think doing an X-ray on one of these pieces will tell us how these front-end modules connect to the antennas, as well as to see if we could actually separate these layers from each other and see if we can get this front-end antenna to break apart from the PCB so we can see the traces. My only concern is that this may have too much metal in it for my X-ray machine. We may not be able to see through it. But there's only one way to find out. I'm going to have to cut this, I think. I don't think it fits. So the question is where to cut it. What is the best way to cut it so we can get a good idea? We could cut, for example, this corner right over here, and we get multiple chips and multiple interfaces. Let's give that a try. Yeah, just as I thought, it is not even close for fitting in here. <laughs> this thing is really, really big. Yeah, unfortunately, we have to cut it. And here's the piece that I cut out that we want to x-ray. And I started to peel off the antenna layer directly from it. And there is something sitting between the antenna layers and the main PCB, which has all the components on it, and most likely a far far at the top. And this is transparent. It's some kind of a polymer. I don't immediately recognize it. I wonder what it is. If you know, let me know in the comment section. And we also see that the patches themselves are floating yet again, and they're not galvanically connected to the elements, the front-end modules. That's not surprising, because we saw 
this was assembled in multiple stages and creating that kind of connection to these patches would have been almost impossible. So yeah, kind of cool to see, which also means that these patches almost certainly couple to the elements underneath using some kind of aperture, and we will have to take a look. They are circularly polarized left and right handed TX RX, as I explained earlier. So we should be able to see some of that hopefully in the X-ray. Now the thing that concerns me is if you look at this, there are many, many, many metal layers and quite a lot of them in there and they're fairly thick actually. So I'm not so sure if my X-ray machine has enough power to overcome all of that and then we can see to resolve the fine features of this. Nonetheless, we're going to try it out anyway and see what we can get. So here we have the X-ray on the left side and the actual image on the right side. And you can use this folded circular patch over here as a frame of reference which corresponds to this one over here under the X-ray. So a lot of these are familiar. For instance, we see the BGA of the digital beam former. We see the front end module scattered around. And you can see that some of the circular patches are present here in the X-ray that corresponds to the ones that I have not taken off. And in the areas where I peeled it off, you don't see the circle anymore, of course, but you see the coupling structures underneath it. And you can see that each of the front end modules, some of them are underneath the patches and some of the patches don't have a front end module under them. This again corresponds to the fact that each of these FEMs probably supports two antennas. So let's take a look and see if there is anything interesting. Well, the coupling structure is quite interesting. As we suspected, this is an aperture coupled structure. It consists of two edge slits perpendicular to each other, giving very good isolation. Each of them is fed from a single point. Now, my guess is that one of them is RX and the other one is TX. Now, having said that, it is interesting that they're able to achieve circular polarization from these structures. It may be from the way the patch sits on top, the location of it. Because in order to achieve a circular polarization from a patch, you need to feed it from two points with equal amplitude and 90 degree out of phase. And depending on the order in which that 90 degrees, you can do left hand and right hand. So that is an interesting structure. It's probably the most interesting part of this entire stack is the, the interaction between these edge slits and the circular patch. You can even see the circular patches don't fully cover the edge slit in some areas. So overall, I think it's really clever. And you can see the power plane slits in the PCB as well. These are probably used to feed VDD into different sections and isolate everything from, from each other. The band gap structures can also be visibly seen over here. And some vias through the board which show very dark because X-ray can feed through them really easily. Some DCTC converter stuff over here uh, that you can see inductors and so on. Yeah, overall, I think we know pretty much everything. Some things are still in question. It could be that, you know, these are RX and both of them are RX and both of them are TX. Although that would be really odd because that would throw off all of the spacing between the antennas that I originally assumed. Again, I'm reverse engineering this here on the spot. Maybe some people from Starlink would chime in the comment section and clarify some of this. But now we have a pretty good idea. It's a beautiful board. Lots and lots of engineering has gone into it. It's indeed not something that can be put together uh, fairly quickly. Because aside from the RF point of view, just the manufacturing of this and getting us to a point where you can throw them out from a factory and assemble them and make them easily distributable is a big challenge. You can make a phased array using machine parts to have unbelievable performance. It just won't be really easily manufacturable. So really my hat's off to the Starlink team for putting this thing together. Okay, so let me go ahead and just uh, quickly fix this over here. Put this back and there we go, good as new. And as always, if you enjoyed this, let me know in the comment section. And if you like these kind of videos, we can do more this type of mailbag stuff and have people send in and do some uh, analysis on it. And if you're from the Starlink team or if you think I got something wrong, let me know in the comment section so that everyone can benefit from it. I always enjoy these kind of discussions. As always, thanks for supporting the channel. I'll see you next time.